you are listening to Catholic Family Podcast. Greetings, fellow travelers through the liturgical year. This is Lisa Davis with another Feast Day Quick Take on the Feast of St. Patrick, history's most famous Irishman, or so you might think, but it's not so. Though the universal image of the Emerald Isle features a harp, a shamrock, and St. Patrick and his bishop's mitre and green chasuble, St. Patrick was not Irish. Many Catholics know this, of course, and some worldlings may have a vague idea of it if they've gotten beyond green beer and four-leaf clovers, neither of which is symbolic of the real celebration today, of course. But the true story of Patrick is another amazing Catholic tale that spans the globe, a tale so big it can't fit in Ireland alone. So who was Patrick? Who were his family? And where was he really from, if not Ireland? Have you heard he was British? Though some might bandy the notion about as an ironic twist, St. Patrick was not technically English, at least not as we understand it today. And though there's a Roman connection we've heard about, Patrick's family didn't really come from the continent either. Here are a few of the facts recorded by the saint himself in his autobiography. St. Patrick was born in the village of Bonaven Tabernia, a spot located near the present-day town of Kilpatrick in Scotland, near the mouth of the River Clyde, not too far from Glasgow. But he would not have called himself Scottish, as Scotland at the start of the 5th century had not yet come into existence. Patrick would likely have claimed rather to be both Roman and British, as the entirety of the largest isle of the British Isles was already known as Britain, or Britannia, in his lifetime though only the southern region we now know as England was occupied by Roman rule and had been raised to the status of a Roman province. St. Patrick's parents, or almost definitely his father, Calphurnius, the son of an illustrious family, hailed from Rome itself and held a position of leadership in the outlying districts of the Roman province. Less is certain concerning St. Patrick's mother, but it is believed that her name was Concessa, and most amazingly, she was the niece of St. Martin of Tours. It is a fact that St. Patrick met up with St. Martin in Italy later on in his life. Perhaps it was a bit of a family reunion, another thread of the tapestry of influences that go into the making of saints. Not every saint has saintly genealogy, and in fact most find their Catholic family in the church triumphant, related not by blood but by the stronger ties of the faith. But it's instructive to see how often the pious inspiration of family members influences children. A child growing up surrounded by a barbarian culture, but carefully raised by disciplined and loving Christians, has a good chance of reaching heights of sanctity. Patrick's people were quite civilized, perhaps even noble, and certainly Christian. But they lived on the edge of some of the most barbaric lands in Europe, during the era that Rome was withdrawing its support and protection, a time fraught with no small amount of chaos for those affiliated with Rome who had chosen to remain behind in the land they had adopted as home. And there is how we see the stage set for the great drama of Patrick's life to begin. It should be no surprise that the dwelling of Calphurnius and his family, close as it was to waterways, was subject to raids by Celtic tribes coming both from the north and from across the Irish Sea. When he was 16 years old, Patrick was kidnapped during one such a raid by Irish invaders who brought him back bound to Ireland. For six months he slaved in the most primitive of conditions in the hills and forests of Ireland, where he tended to the sheep and cattle belonging to the Irish barbarians. Completely alone, torn from home, family, and all comfort, Patrick turned to the faith of his childhood offering his privations in a spirit of contemplation and prayer. His heavenly father became his confidant, his company, his sole comfort, and in the months of solitude the grace of God, a spark, grew into a strong and long-burning fire. Thanks to the Christian instruction provided by his parents, what could have been a meaningless exercise in the bitterness and futility of a captive ended up becoming a torch of salvation for not only Patrick, but for Ireland and eventually all of Europe. But it took a little while for Patrick to be positioned to accomplish all this. After the change of a couple of seasons, tending the Irish cattle, growing every day in his faith, Patrick received a signal grace a dream wherein God commanded him to return to his own country. 
Included in the divine instructions was the important detail that a ship would be standing ready in the harbor waiting for him. But what harbor? Patrick wasn't sure. But secure in faith and hope, he set off immediately, headed east, barefoot, and with only a vague idea of his destination. And of course, after a long walk, nearly two hundred miles, he found his way to the right harbor, with God's providence, arriving at a ship destined for Britain, with no money for passage, and nothing to recommend him but his charm and earnestness, and the hand of God. The crew may not have known why they took on the raggedy young man, but the next thing Patrick knew, he was sailing with them for the coast, making friends with the seamen, and beginning an easy-going but determined catechism for them, in his guileless way, instructing them in the length and breadth and love and power of the true God. A promising start home, you'd think it would be easy sailing, but the trial period wasn't over, it never really is on this earth, and Patrick, it seemed, had need of crosses to store up grace for his future work, eminently for the first souls he would lead to the faith. As it happened, three days into their journey, the ship wrecked on an uninhabited coast of Britain. Patrick and his shipmates made it to shore, then wandered with scarce provisions looking for habitation, food, and water, with no success. Having exhausted all hope and fearing starvation, the crew enjoined Patrick to pray to his reportedly all-powerful God to save them. Patrick's reply in so many words was, I'll pray if you pray with me. And they did. What did they have to lose? God did not disappoint. Almost immediately a herd of swine appeared, which the crew was able to capture and butcher enough to feed them all, and the crew was convinced. With continued prayer, though it took almost a month for them to find civilization, they were never without some kind of victual for the rest of their wanderings. These men were St. Patrick's very first converts to the faith, and a taste of things to come. Young Patrick, after a bit more walking, did finally find his way home to his family near the banks of the River Clyde, and certainly he was imbued with a spirit of the faith he might otherwise never have found without his Irish adventure, but he didn't actually answer the call to a religious life until some time later, after he'd been held captive once again by Irish raiders, this time for only two months. But the short trip seemed to serve as a reminder, a holy kick in the pants. Regardless of his fond family's desire that he remain with them in Britain, Patrick could not put off God's call to convert the land of his captivity. In short order, he began another journey to develop his heart, mind, and soul in the faith, but this time he headed southeast, traveling to France and Italy, where he remained for several years studying. He was ordained to the priesthood and ultimately anointed a bishop in 432, receiving the papal blessing to become the apostle to Ireland by Pope Celestine shortly thereafter. Arriving finally in Ireland, his third visit, but the first he'd embarked upon on purpose, Patrick set straight to work. A hands-on type of guy, he could always be found among the people, preaching, teaching, administering, and converting. No easy job. The winning of souls is always an uphill struggle against a solidly entrenched pagan culture, but God had chosen his warrior well. Patrick's unique combination of command and humility, his deep spirituality, and his obvious love for the people proved ultimately irresistible. By converting several chieftains and other influencers of the Celts, Patrick and his growing communities of monks and priests succeeded in leading souls in bigger and bigger swaths away from the darkness of paganism and into the light of Christianity. In the midst of all his work for souls, Patrick strove constantly to quell and redirect problems within the newly established church in Ireland, calling several councils to settle discipline and structure issues. He is known for his beautiful prayers, especially the famous St. Patrick's Breastplate. He wrote extensively, among other things, completing an autobiography called simply the Confessio. During his lifetime, he founded the monastery at Armagh, his principal seat, as well as the monasteries of Domnach Padraig and Sabhal Padraig. These monasteries, as well as the many churches of the land, well known for their piety and learning, became magnets of holiness earning for Ireland the titles Land of Saint and Scholars and the Nursery of Saints. 
Aside from St. Patrick and his well-loved counterpart, St. Bridget of Kildare, who was the pioneer of women religious of Ireland during this time, we have, just for starters, those who are known as the Twelve Apostles of Ireland. They studied under the student of St. Patrick, St. Finian. All lived and died in the 6th century and were distinguished for their sanctity and made it to the roll call of the saints, along with dozens of others. Catholics the world over recognize the names of such great Irish saints as St. Dymphna, St. Fiacre, St. Colmsil, St. Finbar, St. Brendan, who was one of the twelve, St. Declan, who actually preceded St. Patrick, St. Gall, and St. Kevin. Many great missionary saints in the wake of St. Patrick were dispatched as well from the Catholic treasure box of the Emerald Isle back to Europe to convert, civilize, and mend the rifts of heresy. They traveled in groups of twelve and brought the light of the faith through St. Columba to Scotland, St. Columbanus to France and Italy, St. Gaul to Switzerland, St. Killian to Germany, St. Fergal to Austria, and St. Willibrod to Luxembourg, among others. By the end of his life, around 461 AD, it is estimated that St. Patrick had established 700 churches in Ireland, placed 3,000 pastors, and baptized 100,000 Catholics. We can add to these the number of churches, monasteries, conversions, and baptisms of the Irish missionaries throughout Europe that we have just mentioned, and be amazed. Think of the souls saved. In addition to the miracles revolving around his escapes from Ireland as a young man, St. Patrick is well known for the legendary miracle of ridding Ireland of venomous snakes, and we know through his autobiography that he'd raised up to 33 people from the dead. But these feats of intercession pale in comparison to the spiritual influence he has had upon the entire world. The seed planted by St. Patrick, the faith of the Irish, was, up until the mid-20th century or so, the stuff of legends. Stubbornly held against persecution and tyranny for generations, Catholicism was the identity, the very heart of the Irish people. A love shared around the world by the Irish missionaries and by the vast flood of Irish emigrants, especially at the time of the Diaspora during the Great Famine. From the year 1700 to the present, between 9 and 10 million Irish have left Ireland, almost twice the current population, which numbers only a little over 5 million. So many Irish found refuge in America over the years that today 10% of the population of the United States, over 31 million people, claim Irish heritage, and 30% of Australians, over 2 million people, claim Irish heritage. Along with a large number of German Catholic immigrants, the Irish Catholics in America have contributed the lifeblood of the faith in the church militant bringing religious orders, building countless churches, schools, and hospitals, and having great, big, beautiful Irish families, and everything that goes with that. And I have a thought about that. I'm not sure that modern-day St. Patty's Day revelers understand it themselves, but the heritage of St. Patrick and the Irish people that they borrow on this day provides a sense of belonging to a big, old-fashioned Irish family something our orphaned world yearns for. The loyalty and commitment, the deep belonging and security, the sense of meaning, and God at the head of the table. Faith and family. And a glass of beer, sure, if you're of age, but only after beginning the day with Mass. All things in their proper order. The world is starving for this, though it doesn't know it. Ireland, that once had it in large measure, is starving now too, God bless her. Pray for Ireland. For all Irish throughout the world, even if they are only Irish on St. Patrick's Day, for St. Patrick to ignite the fire of the faith once again. St. Patrick's Breastplate Prayer in its entirety. I arise today through a mighty strength, the invocation of the Trinity, through the belief in the threeness, through confessions of the oneness of the Creator of creation. I arise today through the strength of Christ's birth with his baptism, through the strength of his crucifixion with his burial, through the strength of his resurrection with his ascension, through the strength of his descent for the judgment of doom. I arise today through the strength of the love, cherubim, in obedience of angels, in the service of archangels, in hope of resurrection to meet with reward in prayers of patriarchs, in predictions of prophets, in preaching of apostles, in faith of confessors, in innocence of holy virgins, in deeds of righteous men. 
I arise today through the strength of heaven, light of sun, radiance of moon, splendor of fire, speed of lightning, swiftness of wind, depth of sea, stability of earth, firmness of rock. I arise today through God's strength to pilot me, God's might to uphold me, God's wisdom to guide me, God's eye to look before me, God's ear to hear me, God's word to speak for me, God's hand to guard me, God's way to lie before me, God's shield to protect me, God's host to save me. From snares of devils, from temptations of vices, from everyone who shall wish me ill, summon today all these powers between me and those evils, against every cruel, merciless power that may oppose my body and soul, against incantations and false prophets, against black laws of pagandom, against false laws of heretics, against craft of idolatry, against spells of witches and smiths and wizards, against every knowledge that corrupts man's body and soul. Christ to shield me today against poison, against burning, against drowning, against wounding, so that there may come to me abundance of reward. Christ with me, Christ before me, Christ behind me, Christ in me, Christ beneath me, Christ above me, Christ on my right, Christ on my left, Christ when I lie down, Christ when I sit down, Christ when I arise, Christ in the heart of every man who thinks of me, Christ in the mouth of everyone who speaks of me, Christ in every eye that sees me, Christ in every ear that hears me. I arise today through a mighty strength, the invocation of the Trinity, through belief in the threeness, through confession of the oneness of the Creator of creation. Amen.